Hi everyone, um, I'm Tash, um, it's nice to be here today. Uh, also, by the way, in case you haven't noticed, I have a New Zealand accent, and sometimes I've heard a tendency to speak a little quickly, so if I am being a bit too fast or mumbling or something, just yell out. Um, so hey, um, I am a Kiwi, clearly, and I work for a company called Loyalty New Zealand, funnily enough, based in New Zealand, and we run New Zealand's largest coalition loyalty program, Flybys. So, Flybys is a pretty basic proposition. You swipe your Flybys card at any of our associated partners, um, so they might be grocery stores, retail shops, household electricity insurance, um, and you earn some Flybys points, which then you can use to redeem for rewards. Uh, and our program has been around since 1996, which I'm sure some of you will fondly remember as the year these Spice Girls came out with their hit single, Wannabe. Um, or you may have been a little more like me and looked a bit like this. Unfortunately, that's not actually a photo of myself, because finding photos of yourself as a one-year-old is a lot harder than random babies on the internet. Who'd have thought? So our program is currently, it's a bit old. Uh, it's old enough to drink anywhere in the world, including America. Um, but that does mean that we have some older technology in the mix. Uh, and it can be surprisingly hard to move on from that. Um, so we've had a bit of older technology, but we've also had a few iterations on some of our core services. But it can be really hard to kind of justify rewriting a system, switching to new technology, or even investing in a refactor when your systems are still fulfilling a business need. So we had some big projects a few years back to kind of move to some cloud-based platform, um, but this isn't actually our story of moving from a 2003 SQL Server instance to Ruby microservices in AWS. This is more about our journey from attempting to move away from a bespoke API framework written in Ruby to using Elixir applications to run our transactional platform. So a long time ago, in 2015, Loyalty New Zealand decided to build a new transactional system for points processing. And we wanted something in the cloud using skill sets we kind of already had in the team that could be developed in parallel and iterated on quickly. So it was 2015. Microservices were very popular, and we were all in. So the only question that we had then was, what do we build our microservices in? So for us, we already had a bunch of Rails apps, so Ruby seemed like quite a logical choice. Uh, however, the frameworks that we had for Ruby microservices at the time weren't really something we wanted to go with. We didn't want the overhead of Rails or something, things like great, we weren't keen on, so we built our own. One of our engineers sat down and wrote Hoodoo, which is a lightweight Rack-based API framework in Ruby, which we then open sourced. And we built out what we called Loyalty Cloud Transactional as a series of microservices in Hoodoo. And this worked pretty well for a few years until we started coming across a few problems. Oh, it's not going to play my little GIF thing. That's right, came across a few little problems. Um, basically, they boil down to the fact that we're a small team. We have currently around eight developers and around 10 times as many applications in production to maintain and develop. And maintaining an open source framework on top of all of that was always going to be difficult. That difficulty was compounded by the next problem. Hoodoo was developed almost entirely by a single engineer. And this had many great aspects, because it was, the code was very consistent throughout it. Um, but it also left us with the fact that when they leave, and they did leave, supporting this framework was going to become even more difficult. And that's not even including now, building out new features. So we also had a few difficulties onboarding new developers, um, especially those with kind of a Rails background. Coming in and doing something that does it a bit differently was a bit tricky. Um, especially because Hoodoo is a very opinionated framework, and like a lot of opinionated frameworks, people tend to be quite opinionated about them. So we had several developers who really liked working with Hoodoo, and we also had several that weren't big fans. Um, but one of the other things that happened was our use case kind of changed. And this isn't exactly related to Hoodoo, but the way that we built our platform in the first place, the way we designed our microservices, our use case changed around that, our business changed direction, and suddenly we're left with a whole bunch of code paths, a whole bunch of complexity that we never use in production. We have so many code paths that have never used, been used in production. We have endpoints, API endpoints, never been used. We have no intention to be using them. Um, so 
one of the things that we're thinking about anyway was consolidating some of these and simplifying uh, for our new use case. Um, so this also isn't to say that we have any problems with Hoodoo. Hoodoo's actually been really great and huge amount of respect for the engineer that just sat down and wrote it to such high quality in such a short time. Um, but our issue lies in the fact that we're a small company. We're not Facebook, we're not one of a big company that can build a framework or a language and open source it and build a community around it and fund any of that. We're a marketing company and our technology is an enabler, not a product. So we started having some discussions. Should we move away from Hoodoo? And this raised a few questions. If we move away and we want to develop new services and something else, what do we develop them in? Rails, Grape? Should we even stick with Ruby? If not, what are our options? So we kind of narrowed it down to Golang and Elixir and eventually decided we were going to build out our new services in Elixir. But this, however, left us with a few things to consider. We had, at that point, 21 microservices written in Hoodoo, which is a few. As nice as it might have been to uh, rewrite some of those in Elixir, um, we weren't really going to be able to do that at the start. So we knew that, for the time being, any new services we built were going to have to play ball with our existing ones. So this means one of our key aims was consistency. And this quote, I think, is as applicable to parenting as it is to APIs. Our children are counting on us to provide two things, consistency and structure. Children need parents who say what they mean, mean what they say, and do what they say they're going to do. Our API callers are our children. We need, they need consistency. They need to know what they're going to get back and what to do with it. And they need to, yeah. So there were two kind of main areas of consistency that we had to consider, consistency for our API callers, and that's both internal applications and external integrations, and also consistency for us as developers. What do we need to be consistent in? So consistency for them, apart from the obvious of they need to get their data back in the same way and send data to us in the same way, they also need a consistency around authentication. And they also need a consistency around getting sensible and consistent errors back. They need to know whether they're calling our API wrong, whether there's a network issue or something and they should retry, or whether there's something wrong in our application. And they need to do this in the same way that we do for our current existing services. And what did consistency for us look like? Mostly this was small stuff around logging and monitoring our tracing, um, those sorts of things. So that was pretty straightforward. So with our session management, one of the things we needed to keep consistency was our sessions for our API callers. Uh, some of our original discussions involved rehauling our session management and our authentication. That would have been quite nice in some ways, but it's very baked into Hoodoo, and splitting that out would have been very disruptive and would actually it kind of falls into the fact that we don't update that code very often. We don't touch our authentication or our session management code very, very often. So it's not really the kind of biggest impact for us to leave it as it is. But it did leave us with a slight issue in that we ended up basically having to rewrite a bunch of the session handling stuff that we had done in Hoodoo into Elixir and use that in our shared library. And that kind of sucks a little bit, to be honest. We have code duplication. Um, if we want to make changes to the way we do any of it, we have two places to do it in. Um, but the nice thing that, was, that we did have was that it was really easy for us in many ways because there's no change to our callers or anything. There's no real change to anything. We just needed to write a bit of code to pull our sessions out of memcached, chuck them back up. It does leave us with the annoying issue that if we want to develop another service in Go, for example, uh, we're going to have to rewrite that as well. So when building out something new, considering how to make it as language agnostic as possible is actually very useful. Uh, because different languages have different strengths and weaknesses, and being in a position where you can just pick up the best tool for the job would be a great position to be in. But there's always a trade-off, and we do often have to be pragmatic. And so that was what we had to do. With our error responses, we came into a similar thing. So these are kind of the error responses that Hoodoo gives back, and it has a pretty strict set of kind of message and code mappings um, that it sends back to our clients. So we kind of had to do the same thing here that we did with our session, where we basically had to kind of copy that out into our shared library. And this, again, is not great. We have code duplication, and we're getting one step closer to the one thing we don't want to do, which is just rewriting Hoodoo and Elixir. That's not what we're here for. Um, so looking back, I would have preferred to do something a bit more language agnostic, perhaps pulling out our error descriptor mapping into adjacent schema or something, and calling that from both places. Uh, because leaving the thinnest possible layer around accessing that sort of a mapping within our shared library would have been a lot better. But hey, win some, we lose some. With the stuff for us, the um, log formula, 
This was something we found really cool, was just that it was so simple to use uh, Elixir's log formula to basically keep our logs looking exactly the same between our Hoodoo services and our new Elixir services. Um, basically, all we had to do was, I kind of did these slides in the wrong order, but uh, implement the log format a format function um, with the kind of stuff that, how we want our logs to look and our metadata, and then add that to our configuration. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, the other thing we wanted to have was our tracing. So we used Datadog for distributed tracing, um, and we ended up just using the Spandex um, library. And this is a supposedly a platform agnostic tracing library, but currently it only has an adapter for Datadog, so not very agnostic at the moment. Um, but that was actually just really straightforward, um, to be honest. Like we just chucked it in our config, and then we just get our distributed tracing the same that we do for our Ruby services. So that was quite nice. Um, when we started building out these services, we uh, were a little bit in the dark. I don't know if this this is going to play. Is my it's not going to play? Oh, is it playing? Oh. I'm just too impatient, am I? Okay, it doesn't matter. It's just a drunk, it's just a drunk big bird stumbling around some blocks, basically. <laughs> um, so that's right. Um, but we were a little bit like this. Um, we didn't have a lot of Elixir experience within our team, particularly. Um, and when we started first building out our applications, we kind of vaguely heard of Umbrella apps, thought it could be useful, figured we'd just give it a shot, see how we go. One of the nice things that we found with the Umbrella apps was that if we decide one of our applications shouldn't be in there, we can just move it out, no harm done, easy peasy. Um, so that's kind of what we end up doing a little bit. Um, but what is an umbrella app? So I'm sure most of you here probably have a good idea of what umbrella apps are. Some of you may not. Personally, I didn't uh, until I was working on one. Um, and after stumbling into a few minor little issues around configuration and dependencies that I didn't quite understand, I figured I'd just take a look at what they are rather than stumbling around the dark like the drunk big bird. Um, but waiting until I ran into issues with what I was doing before actually Googling what is an umbrella app in Alexa uh, was probably a little bit of a mistake. Um, and taking the time to look into intended use cases for things that we're using, it seems like a no-brainer, but it's also something that we seem to neglect, especially me, far too frequently. Um, and having of that fundamental understanding of the purpose of something that we're going to use is super important. Why was it created? What problem is it trying to solve? We should understand how a hammer is intended to be used before we try to build a house. So what is an umbrella app? It's basically just kind of a way of organizing your code and loosely coupled components within a single code repository without having to mess around with Git submodules or any of that. Um, each application under the kind of grand umbrella app is started under its own supervisor, so they can act as independent services, but they also have a, shared, a default shared set of dependencies and configuration. So you can kind of see that in the structure. You have your umbrella app, and you've got your two kind of sub-apps beneath it. Um, so we can easily specify applications within our umbrella as dependencies for other applications within the umbrella um, to allow them to use them. And to be honest, this isn't really particularly differently from including another elliptic application as a path dependency. Um, but the main benefit that we kind of get is we're able to consolidate our code in a single repository. We're able to run the code together, and it, we can write quite meaningful integration tests. So, but when we initially started with Umbrella Apps, our intention was kind of to develop all of our Elixir applications. Well, it was kind of a vague idea. We could develop all of them under a single LC Elixir services umbrella. Uh, however, we realized that was not what we wanted to do at all. That was not going to work. Um, and so we have ended up moving out some of our applications into their own uh, repos while keeping some together in a single umbrella that makes sense, that have a semantic relationship. Um, so the kind of, I guess it's kind of a logical grouping that I see in some ways, um, because basically what we want to be doing is kind of separating out, like, the way, sorry, what I find um, is quite useful about umbrellas is being able to keep code together um, but also, it's helped us kind of figure out kind of a logical separation of concerns. Like, do these applications really belong together? Are they actually one single application? Or are they really separate? Where do the boundaries lie? Um, so here, like, consider we have a set of financial resources. We might have something like purchases, which kind of, I know you spend some money at a shop, you have a purchase that records that. Um, and then you might have balances, so each account has a, a total balance, how many points you have. Um, you might have immutable ledgers that track changes to your balances, so plus five, minus three. Uh, you might have expiries, and which you send via API, and they expire points from an account, so expire 10 points from this account because they're too old. 
Uh, and we have forecast expiries that might present a view of how many points are due to expire for an account over the next six months. So in January, you're going to expire four points. So it makes sense to me to kind of group these together. They're financially related. We want to kind of transactionally persist our purchases to make the change to our balance, create the resulting record of that change. And we want to do kind of a similar thing for our expiries. And every time we call our expiry forecast, we want to say, OK, well, what's happened since the last time that you had a forecast? What ledgers do I need to adjust for now to give you an accurate representation? So it would be logical to me to kind of put these under kind of a single umbrella, but split them out. So you have your, your calculations and your balances, your ledgers, your currency stuff. That all sits under financial. You have things like purchases and refunds. They're part of your purchase. And you have expiry and your forecast group together. So here we're kind of keeping our code together and we can easily kind of test quite a full flow. But it's quite the way, the one thing I like about this kind of route, rather than having it in a single application and just kind of grouping the modules, is that you have a more definite boundary line. We can have our financial as a dependency for purchase and expiry, but within your purchase, you can't access anything from your expiry. You shouldn't be able to, because they're not, they're not related in that way, but they do have a kind of shared dependency on the financial stuff. Um, so we found that that kind of worked worked okay for us, um, but yeah, having, basically using them as a way to figure out a logical separation of concerns worked for us, and it's, it's not going to work for everything. Um, but should you rewrite an existing piece of software? It's a question. And this one, it, it's actually more relevant if you can see the, the thing playing, because it goes from yeah to nah. Um, <laughs> so it's probably a bit misleading to just have the uh, yeah. Um, I think 90% of the time, the answer to that question is actually no. However tempting it is to rewrite what an existing application that you know is maybe a bit old, a bit messy, a bit gross, don't want to touch it. Often it's fulfilling business needs, and often it's not worth doing it. Um, yeah, because often one of the best ways to rewrite a complex system is to kind of isolate functionality into sensible, loosely coupled components, build these out piece by piece into the new system until you can decommission what was there. Uh, but it is incredibly easy to not quite finish that and to get to the point where you still have 10% left in your old one, and it's just too hard to get it out, and it's still fulfilling business needs, and it just takes a really long time to kind of cut over. And by the time that you get to the point where you have pulled that 10% out and you're ready to move on, what you've built is now old. Tech has moved on. Times have changed. Time for a rewrite. <laughs> so, so there are a few reasons that we might not want to rewrite an existing application. Um, one of those things, it's going to take time, and it's going to take money, and it is going to take a lot more of both of those things than you'll ever anticipate, almost invariably. One of the other things is that it's going to be hard, and I don't mean this from a technical difficulty standpoint. I mean that it's not very fun often and that it can be quite demoralizing when your measure for success in the code that you're writing is that, oh, it does what the other thing did before, and not worse. Great, cool, fun. Um, it's going to impact delivery of new features, both because you're taking time and like, you're taking resource away from developing new features. But the other thing that is also happening is that if you have these two systems that you kind of have in parallel where you're building out a new one, but you're still actively developing features on the old one, if you develop a new feature there, you're going to kind of have to do it in both places. Are you? So it's not always a great thing there. Um, it might not get finished. I'm sure most of you here will probably have known of some sort of a rewrite or even a major refactor that just gets abandoned halfway through. Happens a lot. Um, and also, it might not be an improvement on what is currently there. And this is something that I think people sometimes forget a little bit, is that just because the code that you're writing is newer does not mean that it's better. Uh, there are many, some of the, th sometimes you might look back and you look back on code you wrote a month ago and you go, oh, hey, that was terrible. I can't believe I wrote such junk. But then sometimes you'll look back at code you wrote a month ago and go, wow, how did I do that? That was a really smart solution. Hmm. Um, so what we, what we, you know, even though we've learned a lot, and it might not be code that we've written that we're rewriting, other people might have a lot more experience, um, or they might have what they've written before might be addressing problems we're not considering now. But there are a few things that we, reasons that we, we might want to rewrite. Um, some of these things kind of, come up here. Obviously, every single case is very different and very specific to a set of circumstances, um, whether the question of should you rewrite, should you not, is dependent completely on that. But they often seem to come up a few common reasons. Um, things like the code is a mess. The application is slow. Um, it's using old legacy technology or self-maintained technology. Um, it costs a lot of money. So this might be money in licensing costs, high infrastructure costs. Um, 
again, like security stuff. So if it's often on legacy technology, it might be unsupported, and there might be a lot of security vulnerabilities there. Um, and change in requirements. We might want to rewrite an application because it's not really meeting our new business requirements. Um, and it's good to simplify that. So I'll take a quick look at some of these. So the code is a mess. Yes, code is messy. Often it is. Uh, is that a reason to rewrite? Often it's not. Um, some of the things, I think it's worth taking a look at what makes it messy. If there's things, it's like small things that we can do, can we conform to a strict style, style guide? Um, will that help? Um, can we, you know, do a little bit of refactoring here and there? And also, it's a good question, I think, to ask is, is the code base frequently developed on? If it's something you touch a few times a year, who cares if the code is messy? It's not impacting your kind of, you know, it's not impacting your future development, really. Um, but if it's something that you're developing on frequently, and if it's something that the code being messy and being disorganized or hard to read is a problem, then, yeah, that's definitely worth looking at what we can do about that. Um, but, yeah. Also, one of the other questions that kind of comes off a lot is around performance, things being slow. And again here, what makes it slow? Why is it slow? Generally, it's not going to be the whole application, you know, together. Generally, it'll be a few key places. And, and so sometimes that might be the choice of technology that you have. Sometimes that, you know, it might be really, really slow to start up. It might be slow at performing particular things. It might be bad at concurrency. Um, but there's also some other things that we should be looking at. We should be looking at, you know, like, database lookups and indexing, we should be looking at what our external HTTP calls are. And it's like, things like I find distributed tracing is super helpful to often have a look at, you know, at what points is our application really slow at. Um, and again, just because the code you're writing is newer doesn't mean necessarily that it's better, that it's more performant. You need to be focusing actually on those things um, a little bit. Um, this one's a tricky one. So if it's using unmaintained or self-maintained technology, I think this can often be a bit of a reason, and this was kind of a reason for us. Um, in some cases, it's good to think about, is it critical? Does it get modified often? Because again, maybe it's not worth it. Is it hard to onboard new developers? And this is, again, one that it's, we need, we need our developers to get up to speed quickly, often, and if it's seriously impacting that, yeah, possible to look at you know, rewriting it. Um, but this is also kind of tied in a little bit to the next two things. Is it causing difficulties developing new features? Is the lack of maintainability, meaning that every time you want a new small feature, you then have to build something into the language or the framework or whatever you're using that you've built yourself or isn't maintained anymore? Um, but also, is it impacting developer happiness? And this is something that I think is actually really important, because when developers are not happy with the, with the code bases that they're working on, they might leave. And it might be hard to find developers to come in. And especially if what you're working on is something you have built out yourself. Uh, again, small company. We're not Facebook or one of those things. We can't build a language or a framework and open source it and get the community around and have it, you know, something that becomes a standard. You know? We can't get GraphQL out of us. Um, so, <laughs> there's, so for us, um, one of the things there is that you know, like people it will be harmful for their careers in some ways if what they're working on is very domain specific. If they spend you know, three years working in a framework that is not used anywhere else, people don't always want to do that because they feel that they're not developing their skills in an area they want to do it in, or they're not, it's not going to be marketable, um, and it might not be something that they enjoy doing. Um, and it's in, that is honestly, I think, quite an important factor that maybe isn't considered as often as it should be. Um, because developers who are engaged, who are happy, who are excited about what they're working on, they're better developers. Uh, money, yeah. Uh, if you're paying high infrastructure costs, legacy, like licensing fees for Oracle or whatever, yeah, move off. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Where are we? Oh, see, now it goes. <laughs> Don't know what was I doing wrong. Okay, all right. I thought I, I thought I'd let it talk. Oh, maybe in quick succession. <laughs> Who knows? Um, so one of the other things is business requirements have changed. And to me, I think this is actually a really good reason to rewrite an application. Because when it's, cause does the current architecture, does the language, does the tool, does it make sense for your new use case? Because if it doesn't, then I think it's definitely worth looking at a rewrite um, so that you can get something a lot simpler and that kind of actually meets your users' needs. Um, so what we built, for, for the, so this was kind of us a little bit, what we built four years ago, 
It's been used in a way that was unintended at the time. Our business changed direction. Some of our kind of architecture doesn't really make sense anymore. So for us, kind of simplifying that down a lot is actually going to be really helpful. Um, and the time that it takes to kind of rewrite some of those components is, I think, worth it. Um, yeah, so this was kind of related to the developer happiness one that I kind of mentioned a little before. We want to explore new technology. Um, and having a chance to do that as well with something that we already have in production is kind of actually useful a little bit because, you know, we have something to fall back on. If we build out something new and we kind of get it a bit wrong, it's okay. We've got something that works. Um, but this is, yeah, again, really related to developer happiness and stuff. And also around finding developers, because if you have, like, Oh, I don't know, let's say we built our system in, oh, I'm going to make something up now, I don't know, Haskell or something. I don't know a single Haskell developer in my city. Couldn't find one if you tried. Um, you need, like, appealing to a wide range of developers is good. You don't want to, I guess, restrict yourself with your choices of technology particularly, um, ones that people don't want to work with, that's not going to help the career progression. That's just going to make finding developers a lot harder, and it is already hard enough to find great developers. Um, so how do we rewrite an existing piece of software if we want to do that? How do we do this well? Don't rewrite the existing application. And <laughs> I don't mean this in the sense of don't rewrite the existing application. I mean it more don't replicate the existing application. Don't take what was there and build it in something else. Treat it as a Greenfields project. Look, ask yourself the questions as you would any new project that you're bringing up, any new application. What are we trying to achieve? What are the business rules? What is the purpose of this application? And what are our users' needs for it? And the only time I think that you should really be considering your the shortcomings, uh, sorry, the existing application is around the shortcomings. What is it lacking? Because we need to make sure that what we are building out now actually addresses those shortcomings. If performance was a problem, we need to know why, and we need to know that what we're building now will be performant and will be fast. Um, and you can see this on a really high level. Uh, like on that kind of application level, but you can also see it on a really low level. If you have an existing piece of Ruby code, for example, you have two choices, and you want to rewrite it in Elixir. You have two choices. You can rewrite the code into Elixir, or you can write some Elixir code to achieve the same goal. And that's really what we should always be looking to do. So what are kind of some of the lessons that we learned? What do we love? What do we learn? What do we regret? Um, to be honest, we kind of loved it was really easy to get started, um, so we didn't have a lot of Elixir experience. Um, but I think, especially coming from Ruby, the syntactic similarities made it quite easy to kind of get off the ground a little bit quicker and to just get some things out there and get kind of a handle around the stuff that we're doing. Um, and that was really good. But also the support, like in the, in the community, in the ecosystem, the language, there's a lot of good support. All the things we need to do were just really straightforward, uh, we found. Um, so it was quite nice. And it's been fun. We've really enjoyed it. It's been quite motivating for us to work on something a bit different and a bit newer um, and a bit more exciting than Ruby. Um, some of the things we learned, um, we started out in a bit of a bit of a weird way when we kind of started this a little bit, and we ended up with a few different people writing different applications in Elixir uh, at the same time without probably enough collaboration. And that meant we kind of went off in a few different dire directions, and our code is not very consistent. So that's something we're having to look at now to kind of bring that back together a bit. How do we want our Elixir code to look? How do we make what we've written already kind of conform a little bit more? You know, the way we're doing testing in this service, is it aligned with how we're doing it in this other service? Because it should be. So that's kind of what we learned was that we didn't really necessarily handle that so well. We didn't go in with a great strategy for how to do all of this. Um, and we didn't, I guess, plan it out probably as much as we should have. But hey, that's OK. Um, now we've learned. Next time. Um, and one of the other things also, so we didn't really figure out our use cases particularly well before we actually tried some of this stuff. So we kind of just jumped all in with Umbrella apps. We jumped all in with GraphQL. We ended up writing a service uh, out in GraphQL and then later changing it back to a REST implementation um, because it was not a great use case and it was unnecessary. Um, so I think we probably should have looked a bit more at our use cases uh, before going, hey, hey, I want to try that. Um, although it's still fun and you still learn. Um, what we regret, this is kind of actually basically the same stuff as what we learned, because I kind of wrote it as, oh, we regretted doing this. I'm like, well, we learned. It's kind of the same thing, really, a little bit. Um, so getting stuck in too quickly without thinking out strategy and not spending enough time, I think, evaluating whether we had good use cases for GraphQL. 
Um, we do still have one service that is using GraphQL, but I don't know if it is necessarily needs to be, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so kind of some of the takeaways that um, it would be great if people wanted to take away from this was really kind of these two things, that newer code does not equal better code. The code that you write now does not necessarily mean that it's better than the code that someone else wrote three years ago. Um, you need to figure out why you want to rewrite something, what problems you're trying to solve, and how is rewriting your application and the technology and whatever you're doing, how is it going to solve that? Um, and the other thing here is developer happiness matters. Um, it's actually, I think, hugely important. And things like our technology choices, they're both a technical choice, but they're also actually a social choice. Um, and, the f and that's the impact on the developers that we currently have, developers we're looking to hire. Um, you want, I, and it's also part of the community as well, part of the development community. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of uh, all of that stuff. Um, unfortunately, I've actually come a bit too quick through all of this. When I practiced it, I spoke a lot slower. Um, so, don't really know what happened there. But, um, yeah, on the plus side, if anyone has any questions.